I wanted to title this session, What's Right with the Government? Uh, since we started out lamenting what's wrong with it. <laughs> um, so, oh, I'll come back to that. Are you done? <laughs> no, I was going to ask you. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what, what's right with the government? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you guys to tell me. <laughs> okay, well, what's right? Now, here's my idea. Uh, we have this constitution that starts with we the people. That's us. We're what's right with the government. We just got to keep at it. It's my basic message, but we'll have a couple more ideas about how we can do that, maybe. Um, so let's start with how have we already tried to influence our government to write some of these things that we think are wrong? And we'll just do like kind of an open, tell me things that you've already done. Okay. Member of Congress. And how do you contact them? Telephone, email. Okay, so these are kind of the in-person ones, right? The local visits and town meetings. Mm -hmm. And what's been your experience? Do you feel like you made any progress? No. Yeah, that's very good. Did everybody hear that? It's, it's contacting the people, the staff people in the offices. If you can't get to the member of Congress, they might just agree with you anyway. Or in more cases, in my experience, they won't tell you what they're really thinking. Right, they just think, <laughs> thanks for your answer. Yeah. But, but the staff people, that's their job, is to listen to the constituents and then tell their boss what the constituents are thinking. So they're more likely to spend some time with you and have a real conversation, either on the phone, in person, would be best. And especially in the local offices, you can get to know them. Good point. The um, people that work for members of Congress are in two categories. Right. They're their office staff, which takes care of constituent services and meetings with constituents. And then if they're on a committee, especially if they're chair of the committee, then they have a whole other staff that is just focused on that committee, and that's more in-depth knowledge about the issue that the committee oversees. Uh, so that's a really good thing to know, too, to look up. And, and I think this applies to state level as well as federal, right? Yeah. The email from uh, Sherrod Brown, the senator of Ohio. Oh, he's wonderful. And, and he's, I saw that he has holds a coffee hour with people. Anybody can come in. He's there, not his staff people, or maybe they may be there, but I was absolutely amazed. This is in Washington or in his in state Washington. or both? Yeah, he, yeah. He, his office is open, come in for coffee. Is there anybody else who does that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually pretty common. Um, and I think when we were talking about something before, somebody said, do they listen? And the answer is yes. I mean, every time I hear anybody from Congress and staff people, they say yes, their job is to listen to their constituents. And a lot of them do have regular um, coffees or morning breakfast or something where the constituents that are in Washington. Um, so if you can go to Washington, a lot of times the, the staff in Washington works more on policy stuff and the staff in the local offices work more on if you're having a problem with the federal program or getting your social security check or visas or something like that. Now it's different for different offices. Um, so you should always talk to the staff in the local office because they're the closest to the constituents and they'll report back to Washington. Uh, but if you get a chance to go to Washington, that's a good thing to do too. Because one of the things I was going to ask is, um, out of all these ways of contacting your members of Congress, which do you think is the most effective in getting their attention or getting something in their head? Personal contact. Personal contact, yeah. The rule of thumb is the more effort you put into it, the more they'll pay attention to you. So if you come to Washington, that's a lot of effort. <laughs> if you go visit in the state, that's a pretty lot of effort too. If you send them an email, they'll still count it, but you're not developing a relationship with them necessarily, unless you really bug them with emails a lot, and then they might not like that. But <laughs> so email's better than nothing. Telephone is another way of personal contact. It's not quite as good as in-person, but that's good, and especially if you talk to the staff people that are concerned with the issue. 
And then the town meetings are really good too because um, I was at a town meeting one time where uh, somebody brought up the issue of the School of the Americas. Oh, yeah. And a couple other people in the room said, yeah, what about that? That's a great thing to happen at a town meeting is get <laughs> to show that there's... In, uh, unfortunately, I think some people have um, organized people to go to the town meetings and sit in different parts of the room and act like <laughs> there's more, but uh, it's a good way to get community involvement and get other people involved with the issue too. And again, letters, uh, they take more effort than an email, so um, it's paper and you might get more attention. And again, every office is different. I always tell people, ask your own senators and your own member of Congress or their staff people, what's the best way for me to communicate with you? Because the different offices have different preferences. Some of them actually prefer email because it makes it easier for them to put it automatically into their system and keep track of it. Uh, but most of the time they say a personal face-to-face -face visit. Very good. Let me put that up here. Letters to the editor. And has anybody ever written a letter to the editor? Oh, yeah. What, did you get responses from the community? Publish it. Get it published? Okay. Yeah, I used to do that when I was in Cleveland. It was a lot easier to get it published in Cleveland than the Washington Post. And sometimes I would get people sending, people would look up my address and send me disagreement letters to my house. But that's okay, because you're getting people's attention. You're generating a community. And a lot of times people will write letters to the paper in response to your letter. You've seen that? So, uh, as this gentleman says back here, the members of Congress read their local papers, so it's just like writing a letter to the member of Congress, but it's also writing an open letter to your community. And you get a conversation going, so that's a really good way to do it. Okay, so this, you know what an op-ed is? It's, I think op-ed means opposite the editorial page. It's those longer pieces, opinion pieces, that sometimes famous people write and other times we write. And uh, some newspapers do have this pro and con thing. I know uh, Simone, our executive director, has done that a couple of times and she's gotten in the Washington Post. Uh, so look for ways to do that. Uh, it's a longer piece. And we try to encourage people. Have you heard the, the um, saying grass tops? You hear about grass roots? Yeah. Maybe this is a Washington thing. We talk about grass tops. And these are people like clergy, or uh, CEOs, business people, people whose names are recognized in the community, professors maybe. Um, we try to encourage people to write op-eds and get somebody whose name is known to sign it because it's more likely to get published than if they know the name. So something to think about. The White House, very good. Um, and you can get them by phone. There's also an email. I think it's yeah. president at whitehouse.gov or something like that. Um, and you can write letters. I mean, have you heard that the president reads 10 yeah. letters a day? Yeah. I mean, I heard something just on the other the day that they got a tremendous staff that reads all these yes. things. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so if he can do it, and that's what I've heard about Congress people too. They have a lot of staff that really do read these mm -hmm. things. And I don't know how many of you are C-SPAN junkies like I am that watch these <laughs> speeches on the floors. A lot of times they talk about their constituents. Well, how do they find out about that? Your constituents write a story that grabs their attention, and they're looking for that kind of stuff. Um, also, when you brought up um, something positive about government, uh, before I lose track, uh, when you're talking to your members of Congress and you're trying to develop a relationship, they hear a lot of complaints. They don't hear a lot of thank yous. So it's very good to try to develop a relationship. Uh, if, even if it's somebody who disagrees with you 90% of the time, if you can find something they did good and thank them, start the conversation with, thank you for this. It shows that we share something in common. Now let's talk a little bit more or something like that. Um, so it's a very good thing to do. Talk about um, protests and Ah, protests and demonstrations, of course. Come to Lafayette Park, right by the White House. <laughs> and now you don't have to come to Washington to do protests and demonstrations. They're coming to you, right? I did one this morning with Occupy in Orlando. Did you really? Yeah. Tell us. I didn't do the march because I wanted to be here, and the march started at 1130. Um, but I want to tell you that it was a very invigorating and mm -hmm. uh, 
a positive experience because there were almost uh, maybe 2,000, 3,000 people oh, gathered in the Chamber of Commerce there that signed were very provocative. There was one that said uh, Republican, Democrat, and pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I read a book, does anybody know Judy Canato? Uh, she died recently, but she wrote a lot of books about, um, oh, spirituality. And uh, she wrote one called A Field of Compassion. Did you read that one? And it really struck me. And it was, did anybody uh, back in the 60s read the book The Hundredth Monkey? Do you remember that one? No. It was kind of reminded me of that. It's about consciousness and how consciousness spreads. And the, the idea of the hundredth monkey is that if you, well, it was a story about monkeys learning something, and then once this the critical mass, for <laughs> lack of a better word, of monkeys learned it, the monkeys separated on a totally different island learned it because it was in the monkey consciousness, I guess. Well, the, the field of compassion is like that. There's this field of compassion, and the more people get to think about being engaged and being compassionate and loving your neighbor and you know all these things, the planet. Um, it's out there and it's easier for other people to come into that field the more the field spreads. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that almost like that's the point to be that? Yeah, I haven't read that one, but I think it's probably, yeah. And I think um, there's a lot I've been reading lately about human evolution and it's really kind of exciting. Yeah, the consciousness fair. evolution. I told a new Barbara <laughs> Hubbard about this. Yeah. Uh, Consciousness is evolutionary consciousness that's happening. Yeah. Michael Bell. So to me, that means anything. Let's get up here, go out on the streets. <laughs> Don't want to lose that. Anything that you do contributes to that field, and somehow it's going to make that field be bigger and encompass more people. So I'm very hopeful. Um, on my better days, <laughs> that, that something's going to change. I really do think we're in the middle of a transition with our church and with our government and maybe the world in general. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer that anything we do is going to contribute whether we see the results immediately or not. Um, besides uh, your member of Congress and the White House, um, during these next couple weeks you can also contact the super committee. Remember we talked about them, these 12 guys? Um, I don't know if I have it with me, but they actually have an online suggestion box for the super committee. Do you know about that? Uh, I think I saw that in an email from Move On. And we're going to be getting that out. Network will be getting out an email on that next week because we're going to encourage people to do that. Um, I guess they were getting criticism from doing everything behind closed doors, so they set up this online suggestion box. And hopefully they'll look at the suggestions. So uh, there's an opportunity to do that. And then also the congressional leadership. Um, I didn't find this out till recently either, but uh, the Speaker of the House has an email, and I think it's speaker at house.gov, uh, where you can email the leadership of the House directly. So a few things you can do besides your own member of Congress. Okay, so these are all pretty much about how raising our voice and getting our opinions and our voices out there. Um, what about listening? Is that something we can do? Where would that fit in? Do we want to listen to anybody in the Tea Party? Yes. Why? Okay, negotiate and compromise, they're out there. Why else? Know your enemy. Could we already have, know your enemy would be, yeah, understand the opposition. I would say understand the opposition. <laughs> well, I would say that uh, every person has a bit of the truth. Yeah. Every person has a bit of the truth. What's, what truth might we find in the Tea Party? How about wastefulness? Mm -hmm. Government waste, yeah. Yeah, I was kind of, joking with somebody, I think I mentioned to somebody before, is that um, you know, for years we've been saying, well, where's the outrage? When are the, when are the people going to rise up and be outraged? 
And then they did, and it was the tea party. And I thought, no, that's not what we want. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have the Occupy groups. And I'm, yeah, that's more like it. But if you think about the Occupy groups and the tea party, there might be something in common there. Yes. Different issues. It's just an article. Different issues, but the tea party, what's their main, most, well, they're, some of them have different things, but their main thing is government spending. Where did we see either 20% or 59% of our government spending? They'd be in favor of cutting the military. They're not, they don't want to go over to Libya. They don't want to start new wars. So unlikely allies would be something we might discover by listening. Um, understanding the opposition was the other thing. Um, and then what about... Um, what I'll call the unengaged. Sometimes in church we call these the people in the middle pews. They're not the real reverent ones that sit up in front, and they're not the ones that don't come. <laughs> they're the ones that kind of just sit there and are unengaged. Wouldn't it be good to make some new converts? Or at least, if they're not going to be as radical as we are, listen to their concerns and find out if there's something that might hook them into something? Might get him to write a letter about something. Okay, um, there's a book, it's called The Pentagon Labyrinth and How to Find Your Way Through It. And it's a book of essays that was written by a bunch of guys who used to work in the Pentagon procurement office. And I think all of them are retired now, but even when they were working there, they were advocating for a better procurement, which is buying weapons process, because they could see from the inside that the way the process worked, by leaving so much up to the defense contractors, they kept adding and adding, and then things would go way over budget. And not only would it go way over budget, but it would make the weapon not usable by our troops. So these guys came from where I think Bob Gates came from, is looking out for the troops and what's best for them. And all this, the way that weapons development and procurement is done is not necessarily the best thing for the troops. Um, and I think you all know that uh, producing weapons, you know, the defense contractors try to get the parts of the weapons built in as many congressional districts yeah. as possible. Yeah. And they said not only does that make it more expensive, but there's no accountability for when all that comes together, it's shoddier material, which again makes the weapon dangerous for the troops. So this might be an unlikely ally type, or people might want the same thing for different reasons, and then you got to figure out you know, how to do that. But um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And they, God bless them, they've been at this for years, and they wanted to write this book. They did a briefing for Congress, and then they did one for some people in Washington that I went to. And they are almost begging people to get engaged and ask questions. You don't have to be a weapons procurement expert to ask, what are the threats? What's this weapon going to do? What are we fighting? And some of the uh, people that are looking at the deficit and proposing cuts in military spending are saying, this is what Brookings, the one that I told you was more kind of center, uh, they're a little bit left, but they're more uh, asking the question. I think I have a quote here from one of the Brookings things. Um, well, here's how to show you how they're in the middle. Uh, one of them was, today's defense spending levels are preferable to a major power, major power war or other serious conflict. So um, their argument is we need to look at what our mission is, what we want our military to do, what are the threats, and figure out what we can cut, and don't cut too much. But then they go on and say, we cannot deduce whether U.S. defense budgets are too high or determine appropriate levels with broad and sweeping arguments about the aggregate size of the Pentagon appropriations. Okay, so that's $700 billion. Some people would say, well, let's cut that by a billion, by a hundred billion, or let's cut it by 10%. And Brookings is probably a good one to read because they have the pragmatic argument of, well, why would we say something like that when we don't know what we want our military to do? Let's figure out the policy and the threats and the risk first. And that takes a little bit more conversation to do that. Um, the other thing, has anybody ever heard somebody advocate that our defense spending should be a certain percent of GDP? 
That's one that I hear in Washington. It's a conservative Republican argument. Um, I don't know what our GDP is now, but I guess defense spending is like 3% of GDP, and they think it should be 4%. Mm. And I asked somebody one time, John Isaacs is head of um, one of these arms control groups in Washington, he's been there a long time, and I said, John, does that argument make any sense? And he goes, no. <laughs> I said, thanks, I thought it was just me. <laughs> you know? And that's kind of what Brookings would say too. You don't look at what percent you want to cut, look at what the threat is and what we want our military to do. And I think this is where we can get into the conversation about offense versus defense versus prevention. Our military shouldn't be doing nation building and diplomacy and, and passing out money to, do, to build schools. Our State Department should be doing that. That's preventative. Um, yeah, I think politicians should be smart enough to realize that they can't sustain a war unless they've got public opinion behind them. At least that should have been the lesson of Vietnam. And they know, we don't hear a whole lot of talk about Iraq and Afghanistan, but we gotta keep watching that to make sure that they get those troops out of there. Because um, the public support is falling, and, and again, I, I don't hear this argument, but if we can't win a war in Afghanistan and Iraq with a $700 billion military budget, what good is that budget doing us? Maybe that's too simplistic, but. Um, and then the, uh, oh, the, the harm that, it, that war does in the long run. I mean, we all know this. I mean, these poor veterans that come back and need all this, you know. I mean, we talk about the people that got killed, but what about the people that got injured and have to live the rest of their lives um, like that? And, yeah. and it doesn't do us any good in the eyes of the world either. So keep using those same arguments, keep, keep at it. And then the Cold War weapons don't address the 21st century threats. Our, these aircraft carriers aren't doing us any good in the type of wars we're having now. In fact, well, you know these arguments. It, it shouldn't even be a war. It should be intelligence and policing to catch these terrorists, not going over and killing people. You've alluded to it uh, several times, and that's uh, the the money that goes to the districts, the jobs that are created mm -hmm. in the congressional districts, the, the money this, the money that. And in the past 50 years, we've really gotten ourselves into a big, huge mess with the escalating defense budget. The dis money goes to the districts, jobs are created there, all that stuff is good. But what's bad is that now we have this huge, huge amount of money that if military spending is really cut dramatically, the whole economy collapses. Mm -hmm. Because it's so in, inter, intertwined into a healthy economy where jobs are created and mm -hmm. spending is created. And our bis, biggest export is military stuff. Mm -hmm. We do really well at yeah. blowing stuff up. <laughs> but in order to change that, we have to change the entire economic basis of our country. Mm -hmm. And that's not trivial, that's huge. I mean, the military will acknowledge that if we don't have an economy, there's no sense having a military because our strength as a country is tied to our economy. So they're with us on that argument. So I think everybody knows that we need an economy and it's gotta be based on jobs of the future but because of the problems we identified, this political stuff, we can't seem to agree how to do it. So we gotta keep searching for those kind of solutions. And I think it's gotta involve some government investment in some of these things.